Just a sec. I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think we, uh, we all know why we are here, so I'm not going to talk too much. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Good evening to everybody. This is a, a very uh, interesting and uh, timely opportunity to chat with one of the most interesting analysts of today's foreign policy, uh, Gideon uh, Rachman. And uh, I'm very happy to say hello to you here in this uh, wonderful auditorium of uh, Perez Yorka. I thank them. I don't know if there is anybody representing the law firm here, but uh, it's uh, Perez Yorka for, for those who are from my office, from my diplomatic service. It's, it's a very important name. He was an extremely distinguished foreign minister uh, that uh, I had the opportunity to meet several times, and he was. Uh, one of the key factors of modernity in the post-Franco period. And he was in the government that made us a member of the NATO and, and, and really relevant in terms of foreign policy strategy. And also, I want to thank the uh, publishing house, uh, Critica, for this edition of, uh, of this absolutely uh, superb book that we are going to get to know better today, the age of the strong man. Um, I have to take three, four minutes in order to make the uh, uh, remarks that I should be doing as a representative of the Aspen Institute Spain, who is the organizers of this event. As you might know, and most of you are Aspen fellows, members, friends, we have been here uh, in Spain since 2010, trying to um, uh, increase and, 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 and put on the, on the general conversation uh, what we think is a, a, a key factor for modern societies, open societies, which is uh, leadership based on va values. And we were working, and we have been working, I, I had the honor to, to be the first Secretary General of the Aspen Institute, uh, already under the chairmanship of Javier Solana, who uh, he could not be here with us today. And uh, we have been doing uh, many things. And after I left uh, as ambassador in Berlin, my successor, Jose Areiza, and his team, who are there, did increase and improve the uh, foundation uh, tremendously here. So we have uh, many programs that uh, relate to dialogue and to uh, discuss uh, important topics in uh, the Spanish European society. So I'm very happy that Aspen can be the host of this event. And I'm very happy because what uh, Gideon has written in his book is exactly what we are talking about in Aspen on a regular basis. How how are we going to protect and, and defend our democracies in today's world? And how are we going to work in this new uh, global framework, which is uh, quite different? And, and, and Gideon will explain a, a very interesting aspect of it uh, than the one we, we used to know uh, only 30 years ago. So my thanks uh, to as I said, to the Aspen Institute, but especially my thanks to, to Gideon for being here with us today. He had a terrible day today. I think he had how many interviews? 10, 11? So uh, everybody has been able to listen to him, but not in this very intimate uh, format, which is uh, what the Aspen provides us today. So um, I'm sure you all know who he is. But uh, for those who might not know, I just wanted to briefly uh, sum up his uh, bio. Uh, now he's uh, the chief uh, foreign affairs commentator of the Financial Times. And when I say now, I say since 2006, no? So he's a very experienced uh, uh, foreign affairs commentator who has been talking to all relevant actors in the last 20 years. And before that, he was uh, in the BBC and for 15 years in The Economist as the Europe deputy American editor, 
as Asian editor, as editor in Britain, and European Affairs uh, editor with this wonderful column that we all in Brussels used to read thoroughly called the Charlemagne column. This is his third book, yeah, uh, after Zero Sum World, which is uh, a very, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, you, 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 you talk about globalization post-2008 crisis in a way that I'm afraid has been confirmed by the time. No? And, uh, and then a, a fascinating book for someone, I, I live in Asia also for a while, uh, called e Easternization, uh, War and Peace in the Asian Century. All in all, what uh, we can say about him, many people have written about his works. He got very distinguished awards before. But I, I have to underline um, a sentence by Ivan Krastev, who we both admire very much. He's sharp, he's original, and unsentimental. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a very uh, good description for someone who is really professional and serious about the subjects he's dealing with. So, the age of the strong man is the topic of today, but also, I would say, the topic of today is not only this macho thing, but uh, the future of democracy. And I'm giving him the floor. He will explain to us what the book is about. Uh, I hope not too much, because we want them to buy the book <laughs> later. <laughs> And then uh, we will have a small dialogue, and I uh, beg you to talk to him and ask him whatever you consider would be interesting. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much, Pablo, uh, for that very kind introduction, and thanks to the Aspen Institute for bringing me over to Madrid for hosting me and to Critica, my publishers, for uh, publishing the book. It's, it's really good to be here. Um, and it wasn't too bad, actually. I, th I thought 10 interviews, I'll be dead by the time I get to <laughs> here. But I, here I am, I live. I, I still feel interested in the subject, so that's good. Um, so, uh, yeah, as you say, I'll talk for 15 minutes and then happy to just uh, chat more broadly about the subject. So the question I was asked most often during these many interviews I gave today is, so what defines a strong man? And there are many different characteristics, but if I had to point to one that unites what is a very disparate group of leaders, you know, from Donald Trump to Xi Jinping to Vladimir Putin, Narendra Modi, there are a lot of them in the book. I it is what I call, a, a well, the phrase, the cult of personality. These are all leaders that say that they have a unique claim and unique abilities to lead their country. And that if the country is led by anybody else, there's going to be problems, that, that, that it's dangerous. Um, and as often, Trump gave a particularly succinct uh, summary of that kind of position. When in 2016, he's accepting the nomination for the Republican Party convention, and he gives, as is his wont, a very dark description of what's happening in the United States. I think he later calls it American carnage. Describes all these terrible things that are going wrong. And then he says, I alone can fix it. Uh, and yeah, you laugh. And, but interestingly, I had a German friend who was watching that, uh, that speech, and she began to cry. And I said, you know, she told me about it afterwards. I said, why? And she said, because, you know, when we were brought up to be educated in Germany, uh, we, we were made to watch Hitler's speeches, and that was, she said, that's what you know, he said. Um, and now, I didn't have quite that emotional reaction, but that was what Trump says, but in a different way, it's what they all say. So after Putin annexed uh, Crimea in 2014, there's this huge celebratory debate in, uh, it's not so a debate, it's kind of a celebration in the, in the Duma, and somebody stands up and says, Without Putin, there will be no Russia. You know, the state and the man, the leader, they're one and the same thing. Xi Jinping, who obviously is in the news right now, well, why is he extending his stay in power? I mean, obviously, personal ambition. But the argument is that we need Xi. You know, we, there couldn't be another leader. And to the extent that his thought has been 
written into the Chinese Communist Party's constitution, and in a very creepy way, uh, Chinese Communist Party members, of which there are well over 100 million, have to study it every day. And, uh, and I remember the last time I was in China, which was just before the pandemic, saying to a friend of mine, who is a party member, uh, you know, come on, you don't really study this stuff every day. And he said, oh, yeah, I've got the app on my phone, and he opened it up. And then he said, oh, God, I haven't logged in today. They'll have noticed, you know. Um, and so they get monitored on whether they're studying the stuff. And, f you know, final example, Modi in India. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things about this phenomenon as a kind of footnote is that it spans an authoritarian system like China, uh, a semi-authoritarian system like Russia, a democracy like the United States, and India, which is often said to be the world's greatest democracy, but is you know, becoming less free. And uh, the, I thought the Indian historian Ram Guha put it best when he said, since 2014, the, the whole apparatus of the state has been mobilized to pump out the message that India is Modi, Modi is India, there's no difference. And so that, to give you a couple of practical examples, uh, when you get vaccinated in India or in the pandemic, you've got the vaccination certificate, Modi's face is on it. You know, this is a gift from the prime minister. Uh, and in a sort of what is never a good sign, the greatest, the largest sporting stadium in India has been named after Modi, even though he's still currently the prime minister. Um, so <laughs> what is it that allows these leaders to claim that you need me, or what is the pitch that they make uh, that allows them to say, I alone can fix it? I think in different ways, these are all leaders that say, uh, our country faces a crisis, and that's why you need a strong man leader. And incidentally, they are, although I have some questions today about whether Georgia Maloney will be a strong woman leader, but so far all the ones in my book are men, and I think that the macho posturing is very central to a lot of uh, their style of leadership, right down to you know, Putin's famous bare-chested photographs. Um, and uh, so it's not just sort of, strength of the will, it's actually physical strength, uh, strength that is expressed now in warfare that uh, is part of the appeal. But to say that you need a physical strongman, they say that the country is in crisis. Now, the kind of crisis that they evoke can be a bit different. Um, for Trump, a lot of it was about immigration, that immigrants are flooding into the country. And if you remember, it now seems incredible, one of the first things he did was to literally try to ban all Muslims from entering the United States, the Muslim ban. He also says we've got to build a wall, and there's a constant rhetoric, which I think perhaps sort of reflects his own personal foibles, whether he says they're laughing at us, the whole world's laughing at us, uh, and you need, you need me to, to turn it round to make us respected strong again. Um, so Trump's cr crisis, is, it varies, but immigration is very central to it. Putin's crisis, you know, even now in his speeches, he's say, referring to the, the terrible 1990s, uh, the collapse in living standards in Russia and so on, which were bad, but I think were even, w you know, in Putin's, it get, they get worse every year the more Putin talks about them. But also uh, the threat from, as he sees it, it's a classical external security threat that uh, NATO, the West, are out to destroy Russia, that they want to rip Russia apart, that if Ukraine is pulled into us, that, that, that there is an ex existential threat to Russia, and that is why you need a leader like Vladimir Putin, because if you were to allow uh, you know, competition or dissident voices, Navalny, well, Navalny is not an opposition figure, he's a tool of the CIA. Uh, so that is the Putin pitch. I think uh, for Modi, it's a kind of, often an, an ethnic peril that he, uh, which is a little similar to, the, it's a mix of the security threat and the immigration threat. India is an 80% Hindu country, but there is, uh, under Modi, increasing paranoia about the Muslim population. Uh, claims that Muslims are outbreeding the Hindu population, that they are deliberately marrying Hindu women in what is known as a love jihad. Actually, there have been laws passed against love jihad. Um, uh, and that therefore the, the whole identity of the nation is at stake, as well as traditional security threats, Pakistan, to some extent China. Uh, so that is Modi's pitch. But the, the threat can be in other countries, 
It can be crime or corruption, so that uh, Duterte in the Philippines uh, says that the whole nation is at under threat from drug dealers. Now, Philippines had a drugs problem, but it wasn't perhaps as severe as Duterte said, but nonetheless, he came to power promising a vigilante campaign to literally you know, kill a lot of drug dealers. And he delivered on that promise. There was a lot of extrajudicial killing after he came in. And it was, I'm afraid, quite popular. Um, and uh, Bolsonaro, the same, you know, that the, the whole elite is corrupt. Uh, and indeed, there had been these huge corruption trials, as you know, in Brazil. And also crime is a big issue in Brazil, as it is in uh, the Philippines. And I think something that's common to all of these leaders, again, is that they almost all say, you know, this is recent. It used to be better, and we can go back to the way it was. So Trump is saying, make America great again. Putin is saying the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster. Xi Jinping talks about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people. We were a great nation. We had a terrible century of humiliation. My mission is to restore us to that greatness. Um, and, and Bolsonaro even says that he's one of the few Brazilian politicians, or there used to be very few, who said that actually the military dictatorship, those were good years, because we had economic growth, we had stability before all these terrible things that went wrong later. So they're all what I call nostalgic nationalists. They look backwards. And that is a departure when we say, you know, what's, what's happened in the last 20 years? Well, the characteristic politicians of the 1990s, and I think probably was true here in Spain as well, were forward-looking politicians. They were politicians who said, the future's going to be better than the past. So Clinton talked about building a bridge to the 21st century. Tony Blair's uh, campaign theme tune was, things can only get better. And these are people who say, things are getting worse, uh, and they will only get worse unless you give a power to a strongman leader who can churn it all around. And they found a constituency. I mean, these are not generally coup d'etats where they just seize power. Um, Trump, you know, may not have won the election, but he was getting close to 50% of the vote. And a lot of these countries are what I call 50-50 countries, uh, where you have a group of people, often surprisingly similar. Uh, so the liberals, the sort of pro-liberal democracy types will be living in cities, will tend to be highly uh, or relatively educated, university educated, quite international, have passports, doing well economically. The people who are susceptible to the other appeal will be small town, uh, countryside, often, say, in the United States, have seen their living standards slump uh, because of deindustrialization, uh, will be much more concerned about immigration, uh, although they're often living in less diverse areas. They're more worried about the change in the makeup of the country. And so they're susceptible to this argument that uh, things are getting worse and they need to change and we need a strongman figure. As I say, I think in the 1990s it was different. And just to give you a sense of how things have changed, I'll give you just a quick chronology. So for in the book, I, I try to, to almost tell it as a story by having each leader a separate chapter um, chronologically. So we start with Putin in 2000. And I think one of the interesting things about the early strongmen is that it took a long while for the outside world to realize what they were. So when Putin comes in, he says after March 2000, um, you know, there's an election. He says, we are completing Russia's transformation to democracy. And Bill Clinton, who meets him at the time, sort of welcomes him as into the Democrats club. People don't recognize what's going on. The same with Erdogan in 2003, who comes in um, and he says, uh, for a while, he is welcomed in the West as this sort of the Muslim Democrat that we need. Because if you remember, that's the year of maximum paranoia post 9-11, et cetera. And everyone is saying, we've got to find a leader who will reconcile Islam and democracy. This is the guy. you know. And, and they, they ignore all the other signs that this is the guy who also said that democracy is a tram that you ride until it gets to you to your destination. Um, which perhaps is a clue. Uh, and then uh, there's Xi Jinping, comes in in 2012. And I remember, you know, the, the only time I met him was in uh, that year, 2013, with a group of Western leaders, one of whom was the former British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and talking to Brown afterwards. And Brown's position was very much, she is an economic reformer, and what he's going to do is, uh, the main point about him is he's going to liberalize the economy, 
uh, get rid of state-owned enterprises, open up the market, uh, and so on. And that was what she, to, to a group of international visitors, that's what she talked about. Uh, but there were also other things going on that we were not really seeing, that he was initiating an anti-corruption campaign, locking up a lot of his opponents, building military bases across the South China Sea, making China a much less, China was never a democracy, but it had liberals who were pushing for things like freer media, more independent courts. He just wiped all that out. Uh, 2014, you get Modi coming into power in India, uh, and similarly packaged in the West as a kind of economic reformer primarily, but also had all this cultural war stuff and begins to put pressure on independent media, on the courts, etc. Uh, then 2016 is a crucial year. Trump is elected, and 2016 is also the year of Brexit. And I write about that in the book, although, you know, I, some people say it's unfair to put Boris Johnson in there, but I think that. Brexit was a moment, along with Trump, that was part of the rollback of the kind of liberal international order that had been built up in the previous 20 years. So it was part of the story. 2017, Mohammed bin Salman basically seizes power in Saudi Arabia. Um, although he's still only crown prince, it's at that point he begins to you know, uh, imprison relatives and really become the, the central figure in that country. 2018, Bolsonaro is elected in Brazil. So that by 2019, if you look at the, the state of the world, it's collectively been transformed. You have three of the five members of the Security Council, Russia, uh, uh, the United States, and China, with run by strongman leaders, the two most populous countries in the world, China and India. Uh, you have strongman leadership in Turkey, uh, Russia, um, even within the European Union in the form of Orban. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you want to cut it by most powerful countries, most uh, economically powerful countries, population, uh, they're all, it's really spanning the world. And indeed, the two biggest countries in Latin America, because I would include AMLO in the list as well. So Mexico and Brazil. So there we are. That's the situation we got into. But nothing lasts forever. And I think that... I wouldn't care to say when this is going to end, but I think you can point to the characteristic flaws of strongman leadership um, and why it might end and, and how it might end. And the central flaw is that the, the claim that they make, I alone can fix it, is obviously nonsense, that uh, you know, no individual leader has a monopoly on power, uh, has a, mon not a monopoly on wisdom. They may have a monopoly on power for a while. Uh, and that the longer they're in power, often the more likely they are to make a terrible mistake. Because I think you become a megalomaniac. Even if you don't start out as a megalomaniac, after 20 years in power with everybody uh, bowing and scraping and nobody being, everybody scared of you, nobody willing to contradict you, everybody buying into the myth because they have to, uh, you begin to believe your own publicity and you make a big mistake. And that, I think, is what happened with Putin uh, in Ukraine. You could argue that up until that point, he'd been quite a successful leader. Uh, you know, Russia had become a bit richer. His big gambles had worked, you know, in, in Georgia, the annexation of Crimea, the intervention in Syria. But then he really messes up. And, um, and I think all of these leaders in time, th that's likely to happen. Uh, she, arguably, it's happening right now with the economy in big trouble, zero COVID not working well antagonizing the United States through this military buildup and the threats to Taiwan and that knock-on effect on Chinese economic position. The difficulty is that um, it's hard enough to get these leaders out in democratic countries because often, like Orban, they begin to rig the system so that th the election is not actually as free and fair as you would like, or like Trump or Bolsonaro, they may challenge the legitimacy of the election if they lose. But in an authoritarian system, it's really, really hard to get them out because they, they make sure that they control the levers of power right down to things of making very careful that they have strong personal protection. And the, you know, some are some the bodyguards of Vladimir Putin are rich men with estates around uh, R Moscow because he knows who to look after. So it's easy enough to say, well, you know, they've messed up. Surely something's, you know, surely Putin, there'll be a way to get him out. And there may be, but it's, it's not easy. And I would point out that uh, many strongmen leaders die in power. I mean, Franco died in power here. 
Uh, Mao died in power in China. Stalin died in power in Russia. Strongman leaders can be forced out, but quite often they hang around much longer than we would like. So I'll leave it you with that cheerful thought um, and <laughs> happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. I mean, that was very cheerful, yeah. yeah. I mean, mostly at the end, I, mean, I love it. Uh, well, thank you so much for this uh, introduction. I think uh, we all want to read the book more than uh, uh, 10 minutes ago. So uh, I, I will try not to diminish the, the, the excitement of going to a library and getting the book, uh, but try to go into some details that Gideon has been explained to us. And please, after this, uh, kind of a small dialogue, I would beg you to intervene and, and to ask whatever you think might be appropriate. Um, I, I think what you did in the book, and I, I read it uh, these last days, was extraordinary in many senses. But one of the elements that really shocked me was that you put so many different kinds of, of circumstances together, and the dots had a line, and, and you could draw something. Uh, putting from uh, 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 the east to the west, the south to the north, democracies and autocracies, all together with the strong leaders, they have something in common. Could you just elaborate a bit more, Gideon, about what is this typology of the strong leader, whatever circumstances, circumstances it takes, I um, mean, geography, political uh, background, what is it? really common in all of them uh, since the beginning of this Putin era? Let's put it this way. Well, as, as I said in the talk, I think that the claim Can, to could you just put yeah, yeah. it? As I said in the talk, I think the claim to have a unique leadership quality, the creation of a cult of personality, either they do it themselves or once they're in power, Putin <coughs> had image makers who did it for him. Yeah. Um, they are... Um, and I think that that cult of personality, even if it's in a democracy, is implicitly authoritarian because um, if you say the leader is uh, uniquely able to deal with the crisis, then you begin to say, well, of course, we, we mustn't get rid of the leader because then, you know, we'll be lost because yes. he is, is this unique figure. I think that, um, interestingly, they're, they're, they're often conspiracy theorists. Um, uh, which is odd, you know, I used to think that conspiracy theories were held by people without power, you know, who were, and that people in power understood it's more complicated than that. But if you think about people like Erdogan, Trump, Putin in his recent speeches, they all say there's a great plot against me or against the nation out there. Um, and that also is a form of justification that you need me to f f wend off, for, you know, fend off these evil people. Um, and they're, they're, they're nationalists, and uh, they often get along with each other in a funny way. Um, so that I think that, you know, we all talk a lot about the China-Russia relationship. Um, but I think that within that, there's also the Putin-Xi relationship. That they recognize, they have a similar analysis of the West, a similar kind of paranoid view of the West, that they're out to get them and so on. And even Trump, I mean, that is, is very interesting. You know, he was the, allegedly the leader of the free world, but he actually said to uh, a journalist once, you know, the tougher and meaner they are, the better I get on with them. He was talking about Erdogan. And, the, you know, who does he hate? He hates Merkel. Yeah. Uh, he hates these sort of liberal democratic leaders, but he, he calls she the boss and says, you know, says Putin has this great aura about him. Uh, he wants to be them in a funny way. Yeah. Um, not a very funny way, actually. It's quite a chilling <laughs> way. Um, and there was a bit where she, uh, when she abolished the term limits in, ch in China to allow him to rule for life, Trump begins to joke about, you know, we should do that in the United States. <laughs> and his assistant, Fiona Hill, said to me, and I think she wrote in her book, actually, that was not a joke. You know, he, he meant that. Uh, he didn't know how he could do it, but obviously he wanted to do that. Yeah, it's really striking. And, and also another element which surprises me in the, your analysis is the fact that you have these strong men 
coming not only in countries which you could describe as in decline, but in rising powers, in, in countries that are doing very well. So you, you feel that they would need to have an improvement on the top, but just go on like the Deng Xiaoping tradition of going on. Why is it that change? In, 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 is it a personal thing or is it a, a structural thing that leads to that, even if you are doing well? Well, I mean, I think in China it's particularly to do with the difficulty of having a, su a system of succession in a country that's not democratic. Mm. And that after the experience of the Mao years, the more intelligent reformers, including Deng Xiaoping, knew that the cult of personality had been incredibly destructive for China. And they tried to set up a system in which the Communist Party would retain control, you wouldn't have elections, but you would have a kind of internal change within the party, which is why they have term limits, which Ding, Deng introduces in, 2000, in, in uh, 1983, I think. Um, but there's always a risk in a system like that where you don't have a free press, you don't have external mechanisms, that somebody will be able to get such control of the party that they will maneuver the system, that they keep themselves in power, and that is what she has done. But I think there's also a sort of broader cultural thing, which is that, you know, I talked about the sense of crisis, the country in decline, which is very characteristic of the strong man in the West. But why would you want that in India and China where these countries are, are getting better? And I think that what they've done is that they ha have a similar sense of a national humiliation that needs to be reversed, but it's rooted not in the circumstances of today, but in history. Ah. So that for China, for the Communist Party, they say China had a century of humiliation from the British started it, certainly, with the Opium Wars of 1839, and then you had the Japanese invasions, you had... Uh, foreigners owning bits of China, you know, the French and English concessions in Shanghai, where they lived under their own laws, basically semi-imperialism. And uh, China was weak and destroyed, and that the mission of Xi Jinping, as he says it, is the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, but to achieve that we have to be united, we have to be strong, we have to trust in the wisdom of Xi. And I think in India, similar that a lot of the rhetoric of Modi is that we're going to put behind not just the humiliation of being part of the British Empire, but because he's a Hindu nationalist, the humiliation of the Mughal Empire, which was a Muslim empire that preceded. And he says, uh, you know, some of the more extreme Hindutva, Hindu uh, nationalists say, Hindus have been oppressed for a thousand years, you know, the British and then before that the Muslims and that we need this strong leader to make sure that this isn't just a temporary thing that, and, and also I think that they, the rhetoric for, for people who feel that they've been humiliated by history, that the world has looked down on them, it's very intoxicating to have a national leader who they believe is strong and is sort of, you know, standing up for them in the world, making the world uh, respect India or even be a bit frightened of India. They like that. Yeah, well, it's quite scary indeed. Uh, two final uh, questions, and then I give the floor to our audience. Uh, one is the, um, in this typology of this, let's say, 21st century strongman, we're talking about the 21st century, actually, it's, 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 it's great how you describe the, 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 the beginning of, of uh, a new, new Year's Eve uh, 1999, when yeah. Putin took power. So 21st century strongmen, are they different of the previous strongmen? And if they are, could we consider that there is something like structural in the way we do politics in the 21st century, which is also different than previous times? And in that respect, in this very long question, would you consider that there is a kind of ingrained and natural populism in today's politics that it was not there before? Well, I mean, you're right that, that, that obviously we all think back to the 1930s and the last period of sort of rise of strong men in Europe. And there are analogies, but it's never going to be exactly the same. Um, and I think that um, the world is much more globalized now, it's richer than it was in the 1930s. 
Europe back in the 1930s was still recovering from the First World War. And uh, so maybe our societies are a little bit more resilient, one hopes. I think the other thing is that the, um, the kind of technological context is very different and that political leaders often reflect and are shaped by the technologies of their time so that Roosevelt was a master of the radio. Kennedy becomes president because he's better on television than Nixon. And Trump is the Twitter president. You know, social media is what shapes these, these leaders. And I think that it's not a coincidence that the age of the strong man, as I call it, is also the age of the rise of social media. Because what these strong man leaders specialize in is something that social media really helps you with, which is uh, alternative facts, as Trump calls them, or just falsities. And if you're, if you're putting out your message directly via Twitter or via Facebook, you don't have the normal, what we used to regard as the normal monitoring process of, uh, of uh, newspapers, which was not print something if it wasn't true. Mm. You can put stuff out there, and it goes directly to your readers, and also the things that they like. And on Facebook, you don't say true or false. You say like or dislike. Mm -hmm. uh, and the things they like are often things that get you, that are emotional that make you angry or that make you laugh. Uh, they may not be true, but they go viral. And these leaders, I think, are all, almost all, very effective users of social media. Trump, I mentioned, Bolsonaro is another who's a prolific on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and the Philippines election of 2016, at Facebook they called the Philippines patient zero because it was the first election where they could see how Facebook had really turned the election and bypassed the traditional media. And Duterte was putting out all these scare stories about crime through Facebook. So fascinating. OK, so now is your turn. So I, I, I just, OK. Can you introduce yourself? And then uh, is there a micro here or maybe a cappella, how you, whatever you prefer? <laughs> Hi, my name is Pino Bethencourt. I'm a, an executive coach. So I've been looking at leadership for the last 20 or 30 years and working with people to train that leadership. Um, thank you very much for that perspective. You really summarized 30 years of history in a few sentences, which is wonderful to see, you know? Um, and what most calls my attention is this idea that the strong man is really a fantasy. I mean, we all know it's a fantasy, mm -hmm. and we're asking ourselves why it works. Um, and it works because people are scared. Yeah. So the, the question I have, and I'm not sure that you can answer it, but maybe we should all be thinking about it, is how do we help people learn how to get rid of their own fears? Because in extreme cases, they're paranoid conspiracies. Mm -hmm. But the truth is we've, ri we've built this whole system based on fear. You have to study so that you can make money, so that you, don't, you can buy a house, because otherwise you're going to be out in the cold, you're going to be hungry. Everything we do is about avoiding uh, stuff that we're scared of. And we're, we're, we're building this into children from a very young age, so that when we all get to adults, we want a strong man fantasy to buy, you know, to rid us of all our fears and buy the fantasy that they're going to save us. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think you okay, yeah. Uh, so I think you're right uh, that, that they are they are people who appeal to fear um, or to people who are scared. And of course, if you're if you're scared, you look for protection. And who who would you look to but somebody who offers an image of strength? And, th and that is very much the idea that there are enemies out there and I, I know how to beat the enemy, you know, put your trust in me. And I think also that, as you say, um, our societies and increasingly, you know, post-communist societies as well um, are set up, you know, maybe we, we do have social security nets, etc., cetera, but, but they're quite brutal in some ways. They're, you know, there's, you succeed or you fail and even if you don't actually starve, you can feel like a failure, you know, that uh, people uh, feel the judgment of others on them. And, um, and so how do you respond to that failure if that's what's happening to you? You might be attracted to somebody who says, actually, it's not your fault. Uh, and probably it isn't your fault, but, you know, it's not your fault because there's, there's an evil group, an elite group, that seized power 
uh, and that's manipulating the system against you. And I, I'm for you, and the guys in power, the ones with the money and the wealth, um, they've rigged the system. That's actually quite emotionally appealing as a, as a thing, and it kind of makes, you know, and it's not obviously, it's, I mean, as you say, some of it, it f spirals off into QAnon fantasy stuff, which is obviously complete nonsense. But if you're, say, the steel worker who's lost their secure job, it's not total nonsense to say, well, you're in a powerless group and there's a power group and they've kind of rigged the system against you. There's something in that. Um, and so um, to have a leader come along who not only says he'll fix things, but also kind of insults the group you hate. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the attraction for, say, Trump followers was precisely the crudity that a lot of people like us would say, oh, God, you can't say that. That's disgusting. You know, the fact that it was offending people like us was actually pleasing the followers who were kind of pissed off with the urban elites, etc. And that if there's somebody out there who's really sort of shocking them, that's almost part of the attraction, I think. I mean, I, I'm, you know, getting into the realms of popular psychology here, but I think there's something of that sort going on, which is why that we often mistook, you know, that the elite, and I count myself in the, that for this, you know, terms, when, when Trump would do things, they would say, oh, well, he's finished now. You know, you, you can't say that kind of vulgar stuff. Actually, you could. People, people kind of liked it because precisely because it had shock value, I think. Uh, thank you. My name is Luis Cueto. Uh, and my question is uh, the following. For losers of globalization, maybe the enemy is not Russia or, as it was easy in the Cold War, but the owners of multinationals. In my, in my perception, people fear that the democracies are not strong enough to protect them against Elon Musk or Google or Facebook or whatever. So if, if the governments are weak, we need something stronger. Mm. Because if not, uh, the normal powers are not enough. We are isolated. It's not just the point to fight against Putin, mm. but what happens around us that we don't control. So uh, maybe for people in, in UK, the markets that has uh, uh, one the head of the Minister of Economy in two days yeah. uh, are a known uh, enemy hmm. that fears uh, people and who is this enemy, the market or whatever, no? So maybe uh, my question is, is that perception of uncertainty that uh, provokes the anxiety to, to, to have someone to protect us? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, strangely enough in the UK, there isn't the anti-market. People generally are on the side of the markets and not on the side of Liz Truss. I don't know quite why that is, but I think there's a sort of sense that she messed up and uh, maybe the market backlash will come. But for the moment, maybe because this is a conservative government and conservative governments tend to be pro-market, so they can't really say we hate the markets. And the Labour government, you know, will just say, well, this is an incompetent prime minister, not the evil markets. But anyway, that's a slight digression. But I think that attitudes to multinationals, it's, you know, I think that actually what's happened is that there's a very few big financial figures or biz big businessmen who've been identified particularly by conspiracy theorists that, that then, uh, and many of whom are now in power. I mean, people like Erdogan, and most obviously George Soros is, is this figure that they've, uh, they all decide that they hate, whether it's Erdogan, uh, Orban, Trump, Putin. Uh, now, why is it that Bolsonaro has denounced Soros? Everybody thinks Soros is out to get them. Um, and it's partly imitation, you know, that you, you, you learn from Trump to talk about fake news, so you learn from somebody that there's this guy Soros and he's bad. Uh, but also, I think, because Soros funded um, civil society institutions, so in Russia, he funded Memorial, which was the, uh, 
thing that uncovered the truth about Stalinism, which has just been uh, labeled an enemy of the Russian people and closed down. Uh, in Turkey, he was funding democratic institutions. And one of the reasons the Republicans turned against him in the United States was that he was funding uh, initially opposition to the Iraq war and then opposition uh, v voter registration drives. And neither of those things were things that were popular with the Republicans. Uh, and also, he is an easy figure to demonize because he's a financier, he's very international, you know, he lives in New York, but he's Hungarian, he's Jewish, which, uh, f you know, fits in with the Rothschilds, who somehow seem to, they, the Rothschilds used to be the people that you denounce, now you denounce Soros, but sometimes you denounce both if you want to do both. And uh, uh, only lately, actually, have, have people like Bill Gates uh, begun to feature. I was always very interested the way in which Gates managed to stay out of politics because he actually has quite strong political views and he's quite a strong liberal, you know, and he funds all this healthcare research and so on. And for a very long time, he wasn't really in the sort of conspiracy theories, but he certainly is now because of all the vaccine stuff and people have decided that, I mean, that, that Bill Gates would wanted you to be vaccinated so that he could track you. Uh, I mean, he can track you through your phone if he really wants to. But uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think that that. Uh, but I, to me, unless I'm missing something, it's not yet outside of left-wing circles. And a lot of these people are actually right-wing populists. A generalized backlash against multinational capitalism. It's more that there will be individual capitalists who are regarded as part of the plot. Um, my name is uh, Rocio Martinez Samper, and I'm director of Felipe Gonzalez Foundation. So we all agree another sort of leader that the ones you are describing. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I have I have two questions. The first one would be about why. I mean, if we center ourselves in in these strong leaders, strongman leaders in democracies, um, why are they so resilient? Right. In the sense that okay, Trump lost the election, but he still has huge. Uh, massive popular support. Uh, we saw it in the Brazilian elections. Bolsonaro uh, performed much better than uh, expected. Mm -hmm. And because obviously, so, and, and, and you explained to us, they, they come to power because uh, they claim that the delivery that democracy was promising or the prosperity yeah. um, has not been so, but they deliver nothing or they, they get the country backlash but they have huge popular support. Now, why do you think it's that? They still remain with very strong support. And what do you think the strategy of the rest should be? Like, mm. should we, I don't know, attack them in a more uh, strong way? Should we find an, a narrative, an epic uh, about uh, liberal democracy? W what do you think we should do? And this brings me to my second question. That is uh, about how do you do you feel that democracies are threatened? Because obviously democracies are about the liberation, intermediation, and an equilibria between agreement and disagreement. Yeah. And these sort of leaders go directly against these very three, these three institutions that you cannot uh, touch, but that are important to be there, right? So how do yeah. you see the future of democracy? Well, I think that. Um, so why are they so resilient? I think it's partly because of the cult of personality that I described. These people, they don't just, they're, they're quite good at building cults of personality. That's why this, they're, they, they're the sex successful strongman leaders, the ones who emerge. And Trump, although people who hate him think he's a ludicrous figure, there are a lot of people who, who, who really respond to him and who like him and think he, as I said, because he's outrageous, I think they, they kind of like him, he commands attention. And so, all the things that we think discredit him, they discount because they believe in him, not in the media. They don't trust me, they trust Trump. <laughs> so if Trump says, actually, the election was stolen, or um, you know, the January the 6th people were justified, then they tend to follow him rather than <coughs> the media who he's, al he's always told them are liars anyway. Um, and I think that, because it's a kind of emotional commitment to the to the leader, it survives a lot. You know, it's like uh, if you're you forgive somebody you're in love with or politically in love with a lot he, because you believe in them. Um, and so, I think that's true of Trump. It's true to you know Bolsonaro also has a 
you, they lose some supporters, but there's a, a core that's really always going to follow them. And even in the UK, you know, Boris Johnson, if Johnson had been allowed to run against Truss for the Tory party leadership, all the polls showed he would have won. So all the things that the political class think disqualified him, his followers didn't care. You know, so they, they, they build up a personal following for whatever personal qualities they have that appeal to people. Usually that they seem very unorthodox, that they're not a typical politician. Uh, they're something else, uh, amusing, strong, whatever. Um, then how do you attack them? I don't know, to be sure, but I think one thing is you don't do is you don't attack their followers. You don't say, as Hillary Clinton said, that the followers are a basket of deplorables because that completely validates what they're saying, that there is this elite who despise you and it makes their followers angry and, and go towards the person who supports them. I think what you have to do is gradually... Um, direct all your attacks at their, in pointing out their lack of integrity, their lies, try to undermine the stuff that they're, so if they say that they're incorruptible, show they're corrupt. If they show that, say they're strong, show they're weak. But also, the one thing, I know it sounds a bit s sort of strange, but laughter is, you know, these, these people, d they don't like being laughed at, nobody does. But for them, it's particularly dangerous because the, there is something a little bit ludicrous about the whole strongman thing. And if you can, can make it seem ridiculous, maybe that is a way underneath all of it. Uh, but as I say, don't attack the followers. Try to address the grievances of the followers. But try to show the leader that is a hypocrite or, uh, or, or absurd. Um, and the last thing, yeah, protecting democracy, it's a, bit, it's a big task. But I mean, I think you have to... The, the difficulty is that the things that we, I think, would all acknowledge are important, like independent courts, independent media, they're quite abstract. People don't necessarily care about them. They care about things that affect their daily lives. So if Trump is saying, you used to have a great job at $48 an hour, and now all that's on offer is $14 an hour, and we say, but you've gerrymandered that district, or you know, you're packing the Supreme Court, <coughs> To most people, the daily thing is what matters to them, not uh, not the more abstract thing. And I think, you know, I was thinking about it in the context of India. Um, if you're living way out in the countryside, the fact that some editor in Delhi has been arrested, it's terrible, but it's terrible to us. But to you, it's whether, you know, you're, you, you've got clean water or your, your money from the state is not being stolen. That kind of thing is what matters. Thank you, Pablo. Yeah. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> I'm Ollie Smith. I'm strategy director and head of ethics at a digital mental health company called Coa Health. Gideon, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the presentation. I will definitely have to add that book to my increasingly long list of but books to read um, and move it near the top. I wanted to riff on your last answer, actually, because I wanted to ask about economics and quality of life as, as sources of legitimacy for mm. strong men. And I think in the West, there is sometimes a, a story that goes something like, Strong men make the trains run on time, which is great. The economy grows, more middle class people. Those people demand um, that they keep getting richer and therefore democracy sort of magically flourishes from that. Mm. But, and, and of course that then challenges the strong men and the whole system yeah. sort of collapses. But was that ever true? Is that less true now? Does it depend on how wealthy the country is that has a strong man? Is it only really something that's about relative wealth, you know, the kind of the Hindus versus the Muslims in India would be an example, but the absolute level of wealth doesn't matter as long as I'm better than my neighbor, then it doesn't matter. So how, how, sh how should we think about sort of economics as a source of legitimacy for strong men? Well, I mean, I think you're right about one of the reasons that we, we didn't really understand what was happening was that post the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, there was this tri liberal democratic triumphalism in the West, the famous end of history theory and so on. And that therefore, particularly when we looked at the rise of China, uh, we said, look, this country won't succeed if it continues to be a dictatorship because we've seen in the Cold War that dictatorships fail economically. And if they do succeed economically, we've got them the other way because as you say, we'll have a rising middle class, 
a rising middle class will demand freedom, etc., etc. Um, and that turned out to be wrong, although it was a very, very strong belief. Uh, George W. Bush, when you know, a key moment in the rise of China is when they are admitted to the World Trade Organization in 2001. And Bush says at the time, trade freely with China and time is on our side. That's the belief. They become rich, they become democratic, we stop worrying about them. Uh, and it's, it's wrong in, in many respects. They, they did become richer, they didn't become more de democratic, they actually became more authoritarian. So it was an oversimplified version of how politics works and how liberal uh, democracies work. And then similarly, uh, we didn't factor in the idea that actually even in rich countries, relative losses can radicalize people so that you know, by the standards of, a, of an Indian or a Filipino, an unemployed former steel worker in Pennsylvania is still a rich man, but they feel like they're, and they're right, they're worse off than they were before, that their future of their kids is not assured, so they're angry. Um, and that if you think that uh, you're worse off and your kids are gonna be worse off, it's not that irrational to say that the system's failing. Um, so, uh, yes, it's true that rising standards don't necessarily lead to transitions to democracy, um, and that even in rich societies, falling living standards can radicalize people. And a last one, I think another reason that we got it wrong is that we had in our heads, um, or the sort of intellectualizing class who were providing theories to the people like Bush. What had happened in, in other East Asian countries like Taiwan, South Korea, um, which had been autocracies, had become richer and had become democratic. So it's not like this theory was total nonsense and we were just making it up. You had some examples of that. But I think that the difference was that those places were not as uh, totalitarian as China where the, com the, the Communist Party was in much firmer control of the, the society in quite deep levels than you know, a military regime would be. You, know, you have Communist Party cells in sort of every, every company, every university faculty. It's deeply embedded in the, it's a Leninist system. It's not a, it's not a military thing. And secondly, the, the Taiwans, the South Koreas, Indonesia were very susceptible to American influence. And although there were times in the Cold War when America reversed democracy, uh, you know, I Iran, uh, some places in Latin America, by the 1980s, when they were beginning to feel a bit more confident about the way things were going, at critical points, the Americans intervene in South Korea, in the Philippines, in Taiwan to push things along towards a more demo. They fly Marcos out of the country in the Philippines. They have a word with the South Korean dictatorship. They and so that fact that they were sort of part of, susceptible to Western influence mattered. And China obviously isn't, and Russia isn't. You know, a call from the White House is not going to cut it in those places. So, uh, so th that vital influence was not there. Thank you, Pablo. Thanks, uh, Gideon. Uh, very insightful presentation. I'm looking forward to read your book. I'm a, a science and tech journalist and author. Um, uh, I, I have two quick questions and then one long question. I hope I, I don't take long. <laughs> super, <laughs> so super <that's> long. Three. <laughs> okay, super quick. First yeah, one: sure. Is there any uh, strong woman? Second one: um, Do you think the, the um, Daniel Ortega, the president of Nicaragua, shared the same uh, characteristics with those uh, leaders that you were mentioning? Because I think um, he's violent. He's using violence to repress the population. He's an autocrat. But maybe he doesn't share all of the same. Uh, th th it's not the same way of leading or the same. Uh, um, yeah. And, and the last one <laughs> is related to those common characteristics that they all have. And, and another um, additional one, I think, is that they all use uh, surveillance technology and digital technologies to repress population, to censor, to share their uh, their views to, to everyone. You mentioned social media. Um, to control and, and so on, so on, so on. And um, they are also creating their, or, uh, their own um, parcels on the internet, or intranets, you know, yeah. um, China um, 
build the, the Great Firewall in 1997. Russia has ra ruined it. Uh, that I was testing, and he, they are even using it now uh, with the world to protect themselves. And, uh, and the most dangerous part of that is that they are they are trying to export that model. Uh, to others, you know, China has the, the digital Silk Road where they are helping building in digital infrastructure to other countries and then uh, expand their model. And of course, uh, uh, Xi said yesterday that of course their intention is to, to change the, 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 the world order. Um, in a way that so, so it favors them, uh, and that's worrying because if they they, they do that, then then the world will will become more um, autocracies, sure. right? And um, so so my question is, what can be done uh, to prevent that from happening? Uh, I know I know it's hard to answer like. Okay, yeah, I have the answer, uh, but um, I think it's important if we try to reflect sure. on that, um, and that's it. So, uh, on the strong women, yes, one or two. I mean, uh, so Bangladeshi readers said to me I should have included Sheikh Hasina in, in Bangladesh, although interestingly, like, say, Marine Le Pen, she was the descendant of a former strong man leader. Georgia Maloney, where there's been a lot of discussion in these interviews I was doing here, people are interested in whether she might be the first strong woman leader in Europe. I think, as I said, this, this style of leadership is very macho, which is probably why you have a disproportionate number of men who are these kinds of leaders. But I don't think it, it's, it, you know, it can manifest itself in different forms. And but Maloney, if she is able to secure herself in power, She's an Orban admirer, so she clearly has the sort of potential to do some of that. We'll see. Uh, on Ortega, I mean, as you'll have gathered, you know, by mention of Sheikh Hasina and so on, the book is not comprehensive. I, d I didn't attempt to sort of go around the world and write about every strongman leader, partly because I wanted to tell a chronology, as he said, about the 21st century. And I think that it was the, the triumph of liberal democracy was never complete. But for about... 30 years, I mean, even before the fall of Berlin Wall, as you know, here in Spain, things were happening. There was democratization going on in the 70s in Europe and, and uh, Latin America in the 80s. So for about 30 years, the direct of travel was one way. There were still dictators, plenty of them. And then for the last 20 years, the direct of travel has been the other way. And so I wanted to start the book when it starts going wrong, you know, with Putin and others. But there have always been and will continue to be. I mean, others you could point to, Lukashenko in Belarus, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, there's a load of them. Uh, on this um, surveillance technology, yes. I mean, if you wanted to take the sort of super depressing view, you would say that the future is with these people because the internet, which we initially thought was this tool of liberation, information, you could never suppress it, it uh, you know, <coughs> censorship would be over, everybody would have access to all information. Actually, we find out that these little devices we all carry are also superb means of tracking us, controlling us, potentially of cutting us off from banking. You know, if everybody's money is on their phone, as people in China are discovering, that dissidents suddenly find their electronic wallet is frozen and you're in trouble. Uh, and they can see, you know, where, uh, where everything you spend, everywhere you've been. It is very, very Orwellian. Um, and that is why not just you, but lots of people are beginning to take fright at the idea that China will have this kind of technological leadership and that China uh, will spread its tech around the world because it's cheap, it's good, but it also comes with this package that an authoritarian government can use. And that's one of the justifications that, you know, one of the things that's been happening, um, so much has been happening, we've missed it a little bit. I mean, I, there's the Ukraine war and all that. But last week, the US more or less declared sort of tech war on China by massively restricting uh, semiconductor exports to China, making it illegal for any American to work for leading Chinese semiconductor firms. And what the Americans are try saying essentially is, and the Chinese will say this is just super one superpower trying to hold down another superpower, and there's an element of that. But the Americans are also saying, you know, it's important for sort of political freedom around the world that China not become the dominant technological power in the world uh, because they are constructing a technologically driven new form of authoritarianism. 
uh, and that you need uh, democracies to be in charge of this kind of stuff, not autocracies. That then raises questions of, well, you know, Google, Facebook, they also surveil you. But they have a little less power in our societies than Xi Jinping. They have a lot of power, but they, they don't monopolize it uh, in quite the same way. Uh, so we have our own issues with who controls surveillance technology, no doubt about it. Uh, but part of the kind of emerging new Cold War with China centers exactly on this issue of who controls the technologies of the future. Yeah, well, we have, uh, I think, 10 minutes. Uh, so, I mean, let's try to be brief on the question so we can uh, listen to longer answers. So there, there was one there. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Fernando. I, I do executive search. Uh, many thanks for the event and the insights. Uh, in general, uh, talking about positive outlooks and things that you think might be um, uh, moving in the right direction. We've had Trump losing elections, Ukraine being able to stand up to put in uh, a, a out of control inflation in Turkey with Erdogan. No, uh, are there any uh, positive outlooks there uh, that that you think might be pointing in the good direction? Yeah, well, you mentioned a few of them, and uh, as I said, I mean, I think that um, this strongman leadership, for all the claims that the strongmen make about it, is actually a really bad way of running a country. Generally, I mean, you can point to one or two strongmen who who left a positive legacy, uh, you know, I guess if you wanted to go back to the 18th century, you could say, you know, a couple of the enlightened despots, uh, um, but even, uh, and now maybe people, uh, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore is somebody that people always point to. Um, but generally, these people mess up at some point. So it's not going to be hard to find um, examples of that. The, the, the more difficult thing is finding the, the just transition where the mess up then goes into moving hopefully relatively painlessly to something that's better. And f we had quite a few of those, as I said, w in that earlier democratization period, uh, whether it was you know the death of Franco and then the rise of a new system in Spain in a basically a peaceful way, or... Um, you know, uh, the, the fall of the Marcoses in the Philippines where they just are flown out of the country and you have a, they, they try to steal an election and then they don't, um, they don't succeed. I'm afraid that often strongmen, what, what defines whether a strongman falls or not is whether they're prepared to kill enough people. Um, you know, Marcos didn't do it. Uh, in Egypt in 2011, Mubarak didn't do it. Uh, they, there were some deaths, but then when uh, there's a counter coup in Egypt in 2013, it's basically they win because they kill hundreds of people in the streets uh, and lock up a lot of other people. And the, the willingness to use violence in the last resort is really key for these people. Um, actually, what's happening in Iran now is very interesting. Uh, whether that could be a hopeful thing. I mean, it would be amazing if that uh, horrible regime fell. And clearly, after 40 years of it, it seems, you know, there are no real opinion polls in Iran, but that huge numbers of people are completely fed up. Um, and for the moment, they don't seem as willing to use violence as they were in 2009. And that might be because... Uh, a lot of the leaders of the demonstration are young girls, you know, and even secret policemen are a little reluctant to shoot 13-year-old girls in the street. But, um, so I think that, you know, maybe the other th another way of thinking about it is that I think there is such a thing as a sort of global political atmosphere and that one event can sort of change the way people think about it. So just as Trump coming to power then empowers a whole bunch of imitators. People like uh, Bolsonaro, Orban are encouraged and say, okay, as Orban put it, we used to think that, that Europe was our future, now we know that we are the future of Europe. You know, and what they're doing is making a claim and saying things are moving our way, guys, you know. And so, but this kind of strongman leadership is susceptible to sudden upsets. Uh, it could be Putin falling, it could be Iran falling, 
It could be something that we don't imagine happening in China. And then if one of these really big authoritarian regimes cracks, then all their rhetoric about, you know, liberalism is nonsense, people don't really want this, liberalism is failing, democracy is failing, they begin to look like actually they were the people who were wrong. Uh, and the, the, the momentum changes. And I think that that is likely to happen in the long run. I couldn't tell you exactly how, because I think that, you know, it sounds a bit sort of sappy and so on, but people do basically don't enjoy ultimately their living under authoritarian mm. regimes. It's not uh, an experience that, uh, that engenders loyalty. It's a question of how do you get out from underneath it? But eventually people do find a way. Um, and then that can change the atm atmosphere in the world, just as the, you know, the events here change the atmosphere, the events in, in, in Eastern Europe change the atmosphere. So you might, I think, get a big breakthrough for liberalism or a big failure for autocracy. Which one it'll be, I wouldn't say, care to say, but I think it'll happen somewhere. Well, two quick questions there on the third row. Uh, my name is Aurora Minguez. I'm journalist and former correspondent in Berlin and Paris. You're talking about strongmen and uh, Europe is a soft power. Do you think if we continue that way, we're going to be forever irrelevant? Do we need some kind of uh, dose of testosterone in <laughs> Europe in order just to make face to, to all these uh, dictators? And I would like also to ask you your personal opinion about Pedro Sánchez who aspires yeah. <laughs> to be the successor of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, yeah. so the leader of Europe. So well, yeah, can we take two yeah, questions? Yeah, so. yeah. <coughs> My name is Pedro Rodriguez, and I would like to be Gideon Rackman. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, reading your analysis this morning, uh, how strong men do uh, nuclear brinkmanship? Yeah. No, no, then there is a last question there. Um, yes, um, I'm not quite sure. I think maybe you um, already answered it. My name is Teresin Edu, and I'm a sustainability analyst within the financial sector. Um, before you were mentioning that, um, you know, these authoritarian powers are more likely to crack um, in the future, but I just wanted to have your opinion on whether you think there's a shift within society and the way we perceive these authoritarian leaders, um, you know, uh, even though they make mistakes, even though they have um, some lack of integrity, do you think society is becoming more uh, or accepting more of these type of leaders? Thank you. And last but not least. <laughs> last and very short. Is Putin going to use oh, the could nuclear bomb? you introduce bomb? yourself, please? Uh, Ignacio Gil. Ah. Is Putin going to use the nuclear power? Which was sort of the last question in there. So, um, so on testosterone, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think that's the problem, actually. There's too much of that around. Um, I think that, obviously, um, viewed from Beijing or Moscow or whatever, it's quite easy to portray the European system as indecisive, unable to deal with uh, the problems of the world, uh, you know, endless, you know, look at my own country, well, what are we on to our fifth prime minister? Um, but, you know, wh where are people trying to move around the world? They're not generally flooding into China unless they're coming from North Korea, where it's even worse, uh, or to Russia. They're, they're trying to get into Europe, they're trying to get into the United States, into these flawed societies that are nonetheless more attractive than the places they're coming from. And also I think that what looks like a weakness is often a strength in the sense that, you know, these endless European Union meetings that everybody, you've been in a few, maybe you like them, but a lot of, a lot of people <laughs> find, the, find them quite tiring and they say, you know, it just shows we have this function. But actually it's a form of strength that, that, you know, we're not settling arguments by who's got the, the most guns. We actually give small countries a say and if it takes five days of arguing about tiny stuff, fine. That's better than the alternative. And, you know, I think in my own country, uh, the prime minister messed up. 
she'll be out in three months. You know, Putin messed up. He's still there and he's going to stay there. Um, so democracies in extremists have the ability to act quite quickly and change direction quite quickly because they allow open discussion, acknowledgement of failure by the leader, and you move to the next leader. And the next leader may also be terrible, so you move to the next one. You know, but at least you have a correction mechanism. So I don't think that... Uh, uh, and I, I think that we sort of underestimate... I don't think we, Europe looks pathetic and weak to a lot of the world. I think Europe looks quite attractive, actually. Um, but uh, Pedro Sanchez, you're going to think I'm dodging the question, but I honestly don't know enough. And uh, I, I try to avoid lecturing people about their own country when they know a lot more about it than I do. But I, I'm, one of the reasons I'm pleased to be here is to try and find out a little bit more. Um, and nuclear brinkmanship, oh, there was social acceptance. Look, it's a complicated question, but what I would say is that one of the things that is slightly worrying is that if you look at polls of belief in democracy in the West, the young people actually have less faith in democracy than older people. And I think that that um, is not a good sign and probably reflects the fact that economic opportunity is narrowing for people uh, that say, if, you know, if I talk about Britain, that in my generation you could sort of expect to buy a house fairly easily. If you got a job, you'd get, get a house in your 20s, you could have a family and so on. Now, if you want to live in the big cities, it's just impossible. Uh, and, and there are other, you know, job employment is more insecure. So for all those reasons, and also perhaps because memories of the Cold War and so on have dissipated, people are more relaxed about thinking about alternatives to democracy, they, there does seem to be signs that really quite striking numbers of people in the West say that democracy is not an ultimate value, that, they, that they, maybe we do need a strong man leader. That is a bad sign. Um, and on nuclear weapons, um, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I wish I could say I'm absolutely certain that he would never use nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't think he would have any moral objection to le using nuclear weapons. And indeed, Putin's whole moral system seems to be based around the idea that the West are hip hip hypocrites, uh, that the, you know, everything they accuse me of, they do and worse. And you saw that actually in his speech about annexation where he said, you know, the only country that's used nuclear weapons is the United States, and they set a precedent by doing that, you know, which was an implied threat. But it's also this very typically Putin-esque way of arguing that you accuse me of being anti-democrat, you're worse. And so he's sort of preparing psychologically to say, so what, you use them. Um, whether he would, I think, then comes down to a couple of things. Is it actually in his interest? It's hard to see um, any kind of useful way of using a nuclear weapon because if you were to use it in Ukraine, it's very close to Russia. You know, you would con potentially contaminate Russia. A lot of, you know, he's meant to be liberating the Russian speakers of Ukraine. Dropping a nuclear bomb on them wouldn't, doesn't sound like liberation. Um, so all of that uh, is difficult, and that's even aside the risk, obvious risk of escalation that the West has said it will respond. If there's a Western response, there's a Russian response, and we're heading towards annihilation. Um, so uh, all of that would say no, and I hope that's where you could leave it. The only thing that worries me is that I don't think that he can, I think he's losing, and I don't think he can accept losing. I don't think he's going to say, oh, yeah, fine, well, um, I made a mistake. We're going home. We've lost 100,000 people. I've gained nothing. That's it. He's going to keep trying to escalate to try to rescue the situation, whether he can annex a bit of territory, make the West look bad. But the number of things that he has to escalate with is going down. They're running out of conventional ammunition, according to the Western intelligence agencies. This mobilization of troops looks like it's like a complete disaster, you know, with uh, completely unprepared people being sent to the front line, which actually could be the kind of thing that sparks unrest in Russia. Um, so he needs to change the situation somehow. And I don't think using a nuclear weapon is changing it, but threatening to use it. I think what he may want to do is to provoke a kind of Cuban Missile Crisis type situation 
where actually the Americans did negotiate secret, secretly with the Russians, and there was an agreement that the Russians would withdraw uh, from Cuba and the Americans would, would withdraw missiles from Turkey, albeit that wasn't publicized. But there was a deal. And he thinks that Ukraine is completely controlled by America, that the discussion has to be with Biden. Biden at the moment isn't talking. How does he force Biden to talk to him? By uh, making it very visible preparations for a nuclear strike, that you get the nukes out of the bunkers, which you know are being minutely monitored by satellites. We're meant, we'll, we'll be meant to see that and to, to raise the tensions to the point at which he thinks the West will say, enough, okay, we've got to talk and sort this out. Um, and, but once you, if, I mean, you know, this is just supposition, that may never happen. But if he were to try and attempt to do that, obviously it's an incredibly high risk strategy. And if the West calls his bluff and says we're not talking, or if they have talks and those talks go nowhere because he makes demands that we refuse to meet, well, then he has a choice to make. Does, does he maybe try and use a nuclear weapon and up the ante? So it's not impossible, um, and it's certainly a dangerous situation, and Biden himself and Zelensky have both said it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it's you know, probable, but it's possible. Okay, I think we have to stop here. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that most of you would rather stay for a while. I'm just going to close with uh, two remarks. First of all, th this is, of course, it, it is not a happy conversation in many ways, but uh, it has been extremely interesting. I can say that one of the conclusions is that Putin is not a good sport. That was <laughs> what you recently say, which is absolutely true. But the others which are affecting us, us here in this room is that democracies are not immune to strong leaders and people who have no democratic uh, behavior. So our first duty probably is to underline that this is a risk that we are all, we have at home. We, are not, we don't have to look around. And, uh, and, and what Gideon was saying, and, and I find it extremely interesting, is that institutions are important, but they are not enough to protect us. Wealth is obviously an element, but it's not enough to protect us. Delivery from these uh, democratic regimes might not be enough to protect us from uh, autocrats. So what is in our hands? And I would introduce, and this is probably a commercial, uh, education. And I would say at the end of the day, education can be a, a key element, uh, at least at our level, if we want to fight for our liberal open societies. And this is all folks, I think. Gideon, do you have uh, something to add? No, I think that, that's a very good point. I <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot.